If you're considering purchasing solar panels, I think you'll find this video useful. I've tested a lot of solar panels, so I have a pretty good idea of what the performance will be before I even start a test. But I did not get the results I expected in this case. My testing was showing an output way less than I expected, and I thought temperature might be an issue. So I tried fans, I tried water cooling, and I ended up collecting a ton of data. So I have some very interesting results to share today. Welcome back to Projects with Everyday Dave. It's time to look at some data. I recently posted a video where I helped one of my former engineering professors install solar on his roof. He paid less than 30 cents a watt for his panels on a Black Friday sale from Signature Solar. They're Hyperion 400 watt bifacial panels with dark cells and black anodized frames. The black cells, black frames, and black racking look great on the roof. I'll link to the install at the end of this video and in the description. Coincidentally, Signature Solar has a flash sale on the 405 watt version of these panels this weekend only, so I'm scrambling to get this out to you so you'll have some relevant data. I'll be sure and link to that in the description as well. I've mounted two panels here to this open rack from the batch that we installed on his roof to run some tests on, and we'll see how well they perform. One, as intended, with the face out, and one with the back facing out, so I can measure the max performance of the back side. I used my Fluke irradiance meter to measure the solar irradiance and connected each panel to an independent MPPT tracker on my Blue Eddy AC300. I'm using a data logger with K-type thermocouples to measure the backside temperature for each panel as well as the ambient temperature. I'm checking the full panel output and I'm running a test with the backside blocked so I can measure the front and backside performance independently. I'll be using metric and Celsius for the analysis today since those are the standard measurements for most solar panels. Here is a reference Celsius and Fahrenheit chart to help you maintain proper perspective. My first test was on a very hot day with no wind and the ambient temperature hovered right around 32 degrees C or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The panel facing out with no cooling ran about 60 C and the one with the back facing out ran about one degree C cooler, probably because the cells on the back side are a little bit lighter color. When I cooled the panels with water, it pulled the temperature down from 60 C all the way to 25 C. I convinced my wonderful wife to spend hours with me in the blazing sun on a Saturday to take a lot of data. Because of her help, I have some very nice consistent data sets. I started taking data with no backside blocking. The ambient temperature was 32 degrees Celsius with no cooling, the panels were hitting a toasty 60 degrees C, producing only 260 watts at 1,000 watts per square meter. Out of the 400 watt rating, that's only 66% of the rated output. Strangely, the upside down panel was producing almost the same at 231 watts, which is 88% of the face up panel. And that result did not make sense. At first I thought the low performance might be due to the very high surface temperatures, I checked out my bifacial sun gold power panels and they were low at 78% of their rating, but not that low. I threw a fan on the backside and saw an immediate improvement of about 6% in the output. So I decided to try some active cooling. I grabbed the hose and targeted 25 degrees Celsius, which made a shocking difference, much more than it should have. The panels at 60 degrees Celsius were producing 264 watts. When I cooled them to 25 C, they jumped to 374 watts or 94% of the rated output. That's a 42% gain in power just by cooling the panels, but that's still a very strange result. I did not expect the water to make that much difference. That would indicate the thermal coefficient would be about negative 0.8%, and the rating is only negative 0.35% per degree Celsius. The high temperature number should be around 329 watts, not 264 watts. There is no way the lab results are that far off. Something is wrong with my testing. After looking at the data, I finally realized the AC300 was clipping the output due to the low voltage at the higher temperatures. Cooling the panels was increasing the voltage and reducing the amount of clipping that I was getting through the inverter. So I had to scrap that data and switch to a setup with the Anchor Solix. It has a much wider voltage and current band and it won't clip the power output for the panel. Switching to the Anchor setup, the results were much more in line with the expectations, but not nearly as exciting. Unfortunately, the second test was on a much cooler day. The ambient temperature was 20 C with the water cooling. I was at 25.4 C and without cooling, I was at about 43.2 degrees Celsius. The bifacial panel with no blocking and no cooling was achieving 362 Watts at thousand Watts per square meter. The max irradiance was in the 1200 Watt per square meter range, 
which allowed me to achieve maximum measurements as high as 440 watts. So I added cooling with the hose to drop the temperature to around 25 C and a much less exciting result. The performance was boosted by about 14 watts. The power at 1000 watts per square meter was 376 watts or 94% of the rated output, exactly in line with what I would expect and with what I get with other high performance panels. A 4% boost makes a lot more sense. The peak measurements that I got were 452 watts. Of course, these are only 400 watt panels, so clearly you can see with the right conditions, you can far exceed that output. And that's without doing anything to boost the backside performance. So now let's check the theoretical max by isolating the front and backside performance. I blocked the backsides with black faced cardboard and kept the panels at about 25 C using water cooling. Adding cardboard to the backside of the panels insulates them and drives the temperature up even more. So controlling both panels to 25 C using water cooling will do a good job of isolating the panel performance from all the other factors. The front only performance was 369 watts or 92% of the rated output, which is really good for one side only output and the back achieved 232 watts. That gives us a bifaciality rating of 63%. The specification is 70% plus or minus 10%, so that's well within tolerance. This chart gives a quick look at the theoretical max output. The back by itself can produce 232 watts, and the front by itself can produce 369 watts. The front and back together with no blocking or special reflection effort on the back side is 376 watts. The rated output is 400 watts. And I suspect if you put these on an open frame with white rock under them, you'll easily hit that. Then just for fun, if we could somehow shine the full power of the sun on both the front and the back at the same time, the max theoretical output would be just over 600 watts. Future Dave needs to come up with a way to test that theory. The challenge is getting both sides exposed to the full irradiance of the sun at the same time. Hmm, we'll have to think about that. Maybe you have some good ideas of how to do that. You can leave them in the comments below. The advertised bifacial gain is 20%, which would be 480 watts. And with enough of reflection, I think you could probably hit that no problem. But in my testing, you're likely to get 10 to 15% gain in most conditions. Before we look at the actual results on my professor's roof, I should mention that you can find lots more solar panel analysis results, as well as detailed how-to solar projects and lots of other discounts on my website, projectswithdave.com. When you're placing panels on the roof, panel efficiency is very important because space is limited. If I take the 367 watt output and divide it by the total panel area of 1.95 square meters, we get an output of 192.5 watts per square meter. Dividing by the input of 1000 watts per square meter, we get an efficiency of 19.2%. And that is very close to the 20.5% rating for these panels. The other big factor on a roof is cooling. It's hard to keep panels cool so close to the roof. I don't have a big temperature gap to work with, but my data shows a temperature coefficient of minus 0.21% per degree Celsius, slightly better than the rating of 0.35% per degree Celsius. So I was inspired to see if I can plot the temperature impact on a roof using some empirical data from Clint's roof. I looked at the total power production on Clint's roof on several sunny days, no more than 30 days apart near the summer solstice. I plotted them against the high temperature for the day to get this result. Of course, there are lots of other factors in this scenario, such as temperature variation throughout the day, wind speed, slight variations in irradiance, length of day, etc. However, the trend is so clear, I think there is certainly a correlation. From the trend line, I can see we lose 0.6 kilowatt hours per degree Celsius. And if I use the trend line to take a baseline of 58.7 kilowatt hours at 25 C and 55.2 kilowatt hours at 32 C, I end up with a drop of 3.6 kilowatt hours. If I divide that by 58.7 kilowatt hours and the seven degrees Celsius Delta, that gives me a 0.87% per degree Celsius temperature factor. Of course, that's more severe than the lab rated value, but there's a whole host of other factors that we didn't account for but it gives you some idea of what the performance would be on an actual roof. If you're in a really hot climate, you can expect to see a significant degradation in output on those hot days. The clear takeaway here is temperature is a significant factor in production. Unfortunately, I don't have any irradiance measurements to correspond to the roof production numbers. For reference, I picked a day with a clean curve 
and took the peak array output for the day of 8.49 kilowatts and divided that by the total number of panels to get an average panel output peak of 339 watts on a 25 degrees Celsius day. While I don't know the actual temperature and irradiance of the panel, the irradiance would have been much less than my test rack because the roof is at a much more shallow angle. But that still gives you a really good idea of the production potential on an actual installation. I did an entire video on the impact of temperature on solar performance, including panels that are vertical at different angles and different colors. One thing I have found is dark panels naturally run hotter. People like the dark colored panels on the roof because it looks better. However, you're taking the hottest running panel and placing it on a hot roof with very little airflow, and this is a double negative. If possible, I recommend getting regular bifacial panels, mounting them on an open rack with the most reflective surface possible behind or underneath them. But if you want them to look good and they have to be on a roof, these are a pretty good choice. These are not controlled lab results, but you can get lab results from the spec sheet. I do these tests so you can see what kind of performance you will get in the real world. Cooling your panels can improve the output, but I don't think the added complexity of water cooling is worth the trouble. I would just spend the money on more panels. Plus, more panels means more power in the winter when water cooling just won't be much help. I have discounts and links for Signature Solar as well as other great resources for solar panels in the description below and on my website, projectswithdave.com. If you want to learn more about solar panels, Watch one of these two videos right here. The Canadian wildfires have been messing up my data, but my next vertical panel comparison is almost complete and I'll be bringing it soon. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.